This is, a, uh, I think, a, a little bit different than some of the other panels on the agenda today in that um, we're not going to focus so much on technology from a, a, an architecture or traditional systems and operations standpoint. Um, what we wanted to, to chat a little bit about, and, and it, it's really meant to be a dialogue, and hopefully we can save some time at, at the end for some audience participation as well, um, but it's really focusing on the, the changing paradigm of CIO leadership and the different expectations uh, that there are for various types of, of CIOs. I think that, you know, as, as you know, recently as two or three years ago, the template for CIO excellence was really that of a, a phenomenal operating executive, someone who could build a very robust and scalable functional utility that supported the ongoing business operation. And, and, and that job in and of itself was, was, was a real challenge and, and a worthy ambition. Uh, what we've discovered during the course of our activities working with boards of directors and, 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 and leaders in the C-suite is that that's really become the table stakes. And the paradigm for CIO leadership has really begun to shift from that I being information in the traditional sense to really focusing on, on innovation and the expectation for the CIO leader to contribute in ways that are much more commercial in terms of their orientation. Uh, and the ability for the CIO or, or equivalent role or title, because that's also in a state of flux and change, uh, to contribute to an organization all the way from the highest level of corporate governance, which I would distinguish from, from, from technology governance, uh, through, you know, frankly, many of the granular workflows and business processes and the overall connectivity that, 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 that joins it all together. And what we have today, I think, is, is a very interesting cross-section panel um, in, in Scott, Rob, and, and Dan, and, and you know, hopefully you've had a chance to familiarize yourself with their bios a little bit in, in, the, uh, in the book today. Um, but I've known all of them for many years, and I specifically asked them if, if they would share their specific experiences in what got them to where they are today, because I don't think that any of them are CIOs in the traditional sense albeit they have worn that hat at some point in their career. Uh, in Scott's case, uh, Scott uh, uh, is actually a graduate of MIT. I, I think you graduate here when you're about 17 years old and in your undergraduate program went on to earn a PhDs and work for IBM. Uh, one of the most interesting roles that Scott had at IBM and how we became acquainted was when um, Lou Gerstner was hired by IBM to essentially save the company at, at, at a very challenging inflection point. Um, and, and Lou, being a consumer packaged goods executive, was partnered with an executive assistant, which in the IBM parlance is, is not an administrative role, but it's a role for high potential people to collaborate and work closely with, with senior leaders. And Scott was selected to partner with, with Lou and essentially serve as Lou's lifeline to the legacy IBM organization and serve as his consigliere as far as technology was concerned. Uh, and at that point, I intervened in his career and recruited him out to an internet incubator and threw his life completely off kilter. Uh, but uh, Scott continues to, to, to prevail, and, and today is actually with PwC, where he sits not within the IT function, ironically, but sits within the business and is involved in a host of activities, both internal and external, how technology can be strategically deployed to enhance PwC's internal business operations and processes and, and, and collaboration, as well as how they interact with their customers and clients in the marketplace. Uh, Rob is someone I've also known for, for many years, and, and, and Rob has perhaps on paper a more traditional CIO background. Uh, Rob and I became particularly well acquainted when uh, he was with a little company with a, a, a big history named Tyco. And at the time, Rob joined Tyco when uh, Ed Breen had taken over the business. This was in the fallout and aftermath of Dennis Kozlowski and a Corsican toga party that was well publicized. Uh, and, and Rob's job as a divisional CIO at the time was to help transform Tyco, heretofore a large complex holding company, into an operating business. Uh, I think he had you know, 350 separate ERP systems uh, and a lot of stakeholders who were extremely reluctant to, uh, to, 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 uh, to view themselves as one Tyco. And then over time had to be part of the team that actually split that business apart into the separate entities that, that it is today. 
Uh, in, in Dan's case, Dan is also an old friend uh, who has shown a remarkable record of adaptability. If you look at the industries that Dan's worked, uh, from Coca-Cola to Georgia Pacific to Advo and, and most recently to, to Dunkin' Brands, Dan showed how best practices from different industries uh, can really be applied in new settings in, in order to, again, generate meaningful commercial contribution. And, and I think his record was, was most recently uh, realized by his appointment to becoming the chief operating officer of Models uh, Sporting Goods, which is headquartered down in, in, uh, in New York, which must be a real anathema for a, a, a guy from, from Boston. Um, but there's some <laughs> real challenges there, as you can imagine, being in a sport Sporting goods business, whether it's competing with big boxes like Dick's, whether it's uh, the, the the Amazon effect, if you will, in respect to e-commerce. But you know, now he's having to apply everything he's learned in, in a, a new environment and in, a, in in many respects a new job. Um, so I appreciate all of these gentlemen joining us today, and it's as I said, meant to be a dialogue. So I'm going to start off with uh, just a couple questions meant to elicit some of thoughts and impressions and, and ideas. Um, the first, and, and this is the only easy one, I, I, I promise, uh, what, what knowledge and skills will the CIOs of tomorrow need to develop that are different from those attributes and competencies that seem to be so relevant and pertinent today? Uh, Dan, I'm going to start with you. We'll go down the road. Oh, that's good. Uh, <clears throat> so when Sean says we've been friends, uh, we have been uh, going back and forth with each other over the years between the Red Sox and the Yankees. Uh, <laughs> and now that I am in New York City and there's nothing but Yankee uh, everywhere, um, Models is uh, everywhere in Yankee Stadium, and uh, I have to now from a business perspective, love the Yankees because I need them to win. <laughs> Just like I want the New York Rangers to win, right? Uh, it's, all, it's all about the business now and, and having to get up every morning and watch Sports Center for, for a different reason, uh, it, it, it is a little different. But him and I will continue to go after each other on the Red Sox and the Yankees. Um, so how, how's it changed? So from, from where I sit and how I've been trying to be, and, and I think the future is, is um, where it's heading, you, you got to be a business technologist uh, with the keyword business at first, right? Everybody's shaking their head while they're stuffing their face with the with the lunches that they finally got here. Thank you. Um, you have to you have to be able to understand the business, and you know as, as um, Sean mentioned, you know going from Georgia Pacific around paper and and, and building products to Coca Cola uh, to Advo to to Duncan, I had to learn the the core business and understand it from left to right to be able to insert whether it was uh, the you know, process, because a lot of the time it, it starts with the process, and then you enable the process, and then you look at how we generate, generate sales. And uh, I think you really need to get in, involved in, in the business. And uh, my first couple of weeks, I actually worked at, at Models uh, doing all the different, all the different jobs uh, that's, that are on the floor. And you need to understand uh, what the lowest level of the organization is faced with, uh, because that's the way you're going to go about uh, helping to generate sales, generate income uh, for the company. And enabling the technology, to me, is the, is the easy part. It's getting the people uh, to buy into uh, the, the change. And people don't like to change. So how do you become a CIO that gets people to change, not for technology's sake, but for the business and, and get the business to see the opportunity. And then the technology piece, to, in my mind, is the easy part. It's getting everybody on that same path and walking in the same direction. So key is business. Mm -hmm. and I, th I think a lot of that goes back to, to leadership, which I think to a lot of folks tends to be somewhat amorphous. And, and uh, the reality is uh, there's as much science as there is natural proclivity in our experience. And I, I think, you know, as Dan, very eloquently said, we would encourage people to really become students of leadership. And it's not to, to commoditize technology, but I, I think it's to place greater emphasis on your ability to influence those around you in the, uh, in the execution of those desired outcomes. And, and Rob, and, and I, I and fortunately didn't do Rob proper justice because in addition to his CIO accountabilities, Rob also owns all of shared services and, and, and recently was even given some additional uh, accountabilities beyond that. So just to pick up on what Sean and Dan said, I, I would just expand it more to say that a CIO today is more of a portfolio manager, mm. where we're just delivering 
technology. It really is managing the technology that's available to us. So it's taking that shift from core technology from a dollar standpoint, which everyone at the table was expecting to go down and taking those dollars back in and reinvesting them back into the business for either business growth or business expansion. That's really the opportunity. So really to try to, f to figure out how to balance between technology and portfolio management, I think is extremely important. And as Dan said, I don't think you can overstate the value of relationship development. Really being able to spend time with the key executives, whether they're they're C partners of yours or whether they're down in the business themselves. They really help to establish that roadmap for you and being able to move it forward. So from a standpoint of a, the, the, skill, the key skill sets that a, an aspiring CIO, really be able to, to leverage technology. As Sean said, the operation side of it is, a, is table stakes but then to be able to take that, leverage newer technologies, cloud-based computer computing, mobile technologies, SaaS, PaaS, and be able to leverage those and shift your dollars more to more strategic deliver delivery applications or processes is really the value proposition. Scott? So I think it's, I agree with you guys in terms of business and technology and being able to you know, talk about technology in terms of business. What I find interesting is this, these two dates that are in my mind. One is 1985 and one is 1995. Uh, 1985 is the year most people in our company were born in terms of and operating. And so they grew up with the internet. They grew up with Google. Google. When they were three years old, Google was founded. So they've known nothing else but having the internet. And now the people who are 17, they grew up where you know, everyone has an iPhone, of course. Right? And they grow up and they don't use email. And they don't believe in corporations. And so the, the CIO of the future, I think, is being much more now social. Because in the sense that you, know, you are becoming the face of the company for all new employees, for your vendors and your partners. You know, mobile will be the first way people interact with you. And so now, instead of saying, who's the CIO? I mean, there's a, I, I saw a few things, an award winner last year, the, the CIO of SAP or the CIO of other companies. who are actually reaching out socially. And it's hard to do right. Mm -hmm. But the notion is, how can you actually be authentic and transparent to who you are? You know, one CIO actually posts an internal, like an internal tweet, an internal blog post, the results of the senior management meeting five minutes afterwards. That's a lot of transparency, right? So I think this notion of how do you actually engage your employee base, your customer base, and your vendor base on a social basis, and what does that, and what does that feel like when you're now no longer using email, but you're chatting, you have, and you need a voice chat because so information flies so fast in an asynchronous way. The only way to really have a connection is through, a vo is through video now. Yeah. And so that sort of living environment is, is what these 17-year-olds and 27-year-olds will expect. And, that, and I think in the next five to 10 years, you're going to see that shift. Yeah, and that was a, uh, not even on the agenda two years ago as far as the, the conversation was concerned relative to a, an operating CIO uh, 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 model, um, which actually begets the, the next talking point here, which is uh, leveraging IT to actually drive employment, branding, and hiring, as well as engagement. You know, how are you, the three of you specifically, uh, thinking about the talent implications of technology across your workforce, and particularly in the context of kind of this multi-generational workforce where you've got your uh, baby boomers and, and the construct that they have and the covenants that they have with work and potentially the separation between the two, Generation X and, and, and the, the difference uh, in their relationship with, with work, how, how they view it. And, and obviously, you know, Scott, to your point now, Generation Y. And, uh, you know, what you can provide, what you can't provide, but the reality is organizations are now being measured as much by, you know, their, their website and the, the, the portfolio and toolkit that they're offering these potential workers from an attraction basis as well as from a retention basis. You know, if you can't provide me with the, the right platform, the right processes, the right technologies, well, I'll find someone else who can. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take this first and we'll uh, go reverse? Order? I can start. I mean, I think, you know, what I find interesting is, you know, and if you could share some of the, the things that you're doing at PwC, just so we have, you know, some, some real sense of, of concrete examples. Some of the things we're doing, for example, you know, I just recently joined PwC and I came up here and purposefully left the brick at home and tried to do all my business through this. Um, and it's interesting because this is how the 20, the 25 year olds work. And I think what, what you're finding is that your portal into your enterprise will be through a three-inch, maybe a four-inch screen. 
That's how largely most people will see you initially. They're going to look at your recruiting that way. You're going to look at your core business processes. So one of the things that this company did is they looked at, asked a, cr a survey across everyone, what are, what are the core things you have to get done? And a consulting organization is like, well, I've got to enter time. So that's an application. They, I have to be able to track you know, where my billing codes. It's another application. I've got to find people, another application. Another one is I've got to say I'm out of office. So you have these eight basic functions that are set kind of in a global way, but they're all designed for this, right? And then, then, then there's a 40-plus generation that largely runs the organization. And this generation, there's a wonderful gesture that I'm sure you all know, which is this. You take your fingers and you expand. You can now actually read these things. <laughs> and you know, when you actually get a, a portfolio book at a board meeting and you can go like this, and it's like, this is cool. I can actually read this. <laughs> and I think this gesture now is, is, is in a lot of interfaces. I see executives come and go on a PC and you know, do this to it. Um, or you get an app out of, out of the outsourcing partner and you do this and it doesn't do anything. There's a lot of frustration. <laughs> and so I think, it, that's, to me, it's all about putting the data in the hands of people in sort of the way they're used to it. You know, and for the 1985s and 1995s, it's this. And for those that are 40 plus, it's these tablets. And I think that's what, you know, how, how you have to interact with your, with your population. Mm -hmm. I would just add that from a standpoint of attracting and retaining talent, it becomes al almost a mutual interview. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be involved with our college recru recruiting programs. And for the most part, when an individual comes to speak to, they already on their iPhone or their tablet have your website up. And it really very quickly becomes them asking you questions about, we're an engineering firm, so about the technologies we use, the technologies that we consider con contemporary. And it becomes a very, a very different format from a branding standpoint, but also from an interviewing standpoint, and how we want to go ahead and guide the interview. Uh, so we've developed a program internally, it's called EVP, which is our employee value proposition. So basically it starts with being able to leverage the technology that we have from a branding standpoint, start with the college recruiting program, and then take it all the way through. And we pulse the organization on a six-month process to, to see how we're performing on what we said we were going to do on the front side during the interview process to, and get feedback so we can make some adjustments. So from that standpoint, branding becomes ex extremely important. And technology, whether we realize it or not, really helps to set the tone for how at least a new, uh, new entrant into our organization is, start to, is starting to form an opinion of us. From a, as, as Scott mentioned, the, the 40 plus, which I happen to be one of, um, when you take a look at it, the opportunity I think we have there, our CIO has, is adoption. And that's basically, there is technology that's available to transform the business, but it's how do you position it and get that, that tier of the organization to adopt it so that we can go ahead and become, it becomes more widespread and more, more wide used throughout the organization. But just one thing to add to that, I think you really hit a good point here because as a technologist for the CIO of the future, you're now impacting the brand. Right? So your decisions as CIO where you used to be able to get away with, with really cruddy apps because, well, why spend an all extra dollar once we get the functionality stop? That's no longer sufficient. Right? And now what's going to happen is your investment per app or per work process may go up and you're now actually tapping into marketing spend. Mm -hmm. right? So it's a whole different think, think about you know, the apps that you're going to employ as a CIO now actually impact your perception in the marketplace. And that's coming from a guy who works from an accounting firm. <laughs> so <laughs> Thank, Thanks, Sean. Well, that's, that's where I was heading. Uh, yeah, the branding, branding is uh, everything. I think uh, the, the, the two-directional uh, interview does take place, but how many people in this room right now uh, if you had to go back and, and get in front of your Oracle or your SAP screen and, and put a 25-year-old a in front of that, um, that's reality. Um, so unfortunately, um, uh, you know, you get someone in front of the, the uh, purchasing, uh, Oracle purchasing, uh, which I had at Duncan. Um, it, 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 that's not sexy. Um, and, that, and, <laughs> and, and, and we're not going to go spend millions of dollars to make it sexy, right? Um, so unfortunately... Uh, you know, some of the you know, bigger companies that have spent millions of dollars implementing these ERPs, um, y you're not going to be able to go sell them on that. Uh, uh, you're just going to have to say that's the way it is, depending upon the job function, right? But uh, it's, it's not pretty. So, yeah, there has to be, uh, have, you have to have some way of, uh, of bringing that uh, talent on board. And if we can 
uh, have the right apps, to give them the right information. It, com it comes down to what's the job and obviously giving them the right information so they can be successful at their job. But some of these apps, uh, I mean, I inherited, because I also own IT at, at, at Models, I have JDA. And um, I saw, I'm seeing a green screen. I, I grew up programming in an RP, RPG2 and, and three on a 34. I, I went backwards, I'm, I'm there again. I mean, it's, it's RPG. Uh, so uh, it's not sexy on some of those, those apps. So it's, it, it's gonna be a balance because some of these 20 something year olds that get into some of these uh, jobs are gonna be in for a rude awakening. It's not a, an app on their iPhone. <laughs> Nor do I want to put that on the phone. Right. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. You, you know, you, you described it as as, as a balance, uh, Dan, and, and, I, and I think that you know so much of a, a CIO's job is around prioritization and striking that judicious balance, uh, being able to to craft an actionable vision for the technology organization that actually enables you know so many different uh, uh, commercial undertakings. Um, and I think you know I, I mentioned earlier that the I in CIO in many places is beginning to to morph into more of innovation than necessarily the traditional information definition. At the same time, there's a, a great balance there of, of balancing that innovation with risk, being prudent, being pragmatic, mm -hmm. uh, not putting the business at risk. And when we start to you know talk about some of the uh, you know, very progressive uh, uh, approaches to, to interacting with customers and, and uh, the challenges and opportunities that, that things like mobility create. Um, how do we go about striking that balance? Um, you know, how do we create a effective construct that allows us to maximize these opportunities, whether it's mobile, whether it's data and information management, but do it in a way that still you know, provides a, the rigor and discipline that we need? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious because we were talking about this, but how many folks, raise your hands, uh, are looking at uh, bring your own device, implementing it? There you go. Um, uh, and, and the reason, because I, th I think what we're, what we're talking about here is, you know, how far do you swing the pendulum in terms of giving freedom uh, and giving uh, capabilities to, uh, to, the, to your employees to get the job done, to give them that individual uh, capability at, at the data, but you know how far do you go and risk in terms of uh, intellectual property or or um, uh, you know you, someone loses it or whatever? You know you still have to have that security. And and you know how 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 long? I remember uh, uh, way back uh, a few months ago, uh, uh, someone said, "I'm tired of swimming against against the tide. I'm just going to let it open and and uh, let it out and just give the the executives what they want, so to speak." But there comes to a risk, so you're absolutely right, Sean. Uh, um, I, I don't know how far the, to, to let it go, but you gotta be able to have control at the end of the day. Whether they leave the company or they lose it, uh, you need to be able to make sure that uh, that intellectual property stays where it needs to be in managing that. And that's, you know, nobody, nobody likes to be the, uh, uh, someone that brings the bad news, but that's what's going on. And as you can see, everybody's looking into giving everybody that individual piece, whether it's a, 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 a tablet or a smartphone or even the laptop, even though the laptop will go away eventually. We adopted uh, a SaaS solution for collaboration and email in 2007. So we, we did it quite a few years ago. And when we began to do that, we, whether we realized it or not, started to open up the door for bring your own device to work because the key, the key way to access it, if you didn't want to use you know, a desktop tool like Outlook would just be th via a webmail solution. So we actually set the tone at that point without understanding the, the consequences of what we were doing. Now, kind of playing, playing it forward, what we've really realized is that it's happening. So you can either support it or result or just be a receiver of the fallout of it. So our approach is really more on a proactive look at security. It's not really to lock down or stop individuals from being able to access the data because they can. It's really to ensure that if something bad does happen, whether it's, it's misplaced or it's, it's lost or it gets broken, that we have the ability to go ahead and contain any issues that might, might surface by uh, somebody being able to access that data. Because again, uh, the, the proliferation and I think the, the whole notion of, of 
consumerism matching and marrying up with the with the business environment is is very prevalent, and I think we have to adopt it. And then, as a part of adopting it, it's really how do we in turn protect ourselves and ensure that you know moving forward, we can make sure that we don't have any any real breaches within the organization. That's really what our focus is on. I couldn't agree more with what you're talking about, security being paramount here. Um, but I think what, there's an imbalance, and I think the industry has yet solved it, where you have to balance security now with user interface and ease, and ease of use. And we, a lot of times we get caught up, we have a PC, we know, oh, PC is where we're going to lock down, we'll secure the drive, we'll encrypt the drive, we'll add a, 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 a pin that we change every three months. And as a result, I see, I can't tell you how many iPhones I see where people have two iPhones. One I give them, and one they use. And I think it's you know, the notion of, you know, I'm a jogger, and I'll be out jogging, I'll get a text from somebody, I want to respond, and trying to enter a pin when you're jogging on an iPhone is, is really difficult. And, and that's, almost, that's the equivalent of just looking at one technology and saying we need to ha have a very tight security like we did on the, on the laptop, but not th thinking through the whole process. So for example, even though it's really secure for the pin, I can go take that, plug into a Linux box, and get right to the data, right? And I think we have to look at this in terms of, as we're writing security these devices, the decisions we make on security have to be, you know, by law, follow regulations and, and protect the assets of the company. But at the same time, those decisions are impacting how people view your company, mm -hmm. you know, how people interact with your business, and the cycle time for them to get things done. Productivity. Yeah. Right? And so, if, you know, if a mobile device is, is used for a minute interaction between subway cars on New York as it's used, and if it takes you that long to get in, you're going to miss the chance to make a decision. And the second you make a decision your competitor does, you're going to be in the hot water. Mm -hmm. right? So the question is, how do you balance security and interface? And I, I don't know the answer yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, th that's interesting, because I, I think that also speaks to you know, one of the other uh, agenda topics today that, that we find is becoming pervasive in, in, in the, uh, the boardroom across industries. And that is the, the rise of you know, data and information as a strategic resource. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's the insurance industry, whether it's the retail industry, whether it's the energy industry, uh, when we engage in dialogue with the senior stakeholders, inevitably someone will bring up uh, that a key asset, as we kind of go through our punch list, a key asset of the organization are their data and information assets. Uh, and many organizations say in a media or more content-driven business, or superficially more, uh, more content-driven, will talk about how they can better uh, monetize and productize those assets vis-a-vis -vis their customers in the marketplace. Some people like to speak of it in a more you know, kind of legacy language of business intelligence, decision support, and how it can be deployed and allow them to make better decisions vis-a-vis uh, -vis in, in, in internal uh, business operations. Um, and, and of course, we've got you know, a, a huge vendor community that's immediately jumped onto this bandwagon and is trying to you know, market it in, in numerous different ways to us. And you know, it's kind of like the concept of outsourcing. Well, you know, we have Service bureaus in the 1970s, but you know, I guess because we call it outsourcing, it's you know, it's contemporary. Um, how do you view the? Uh, how do you see organizations better unlocking and tapping into the power of their data and information assets again in, in a practical manner? And who do you see as being the key partners? Uh, in, in, in doing so, and, and what I mean by that is, historically, for good or bad, the CFO was the key CIO partnership, whether it was to be a, a watchdog, uh, whether it was to you know, be a, a close ally or somewhere in between, that was the, the key partnership for many CIOs, irrespective if they reported to the CEO or anyone else. With the rise of data, we are seeing that another key CMO. partnership is emerging that of the chief marketing officer. Mm -hmm. And this is also a very demanding uh, constituency in that they want actionable knowledge. How are you going about taking these data and information assets, converting them into actionable knowledge, and who are those key stakeholders that you're collaborating with? May I start with sure, this? Sure. So you're talking about like big data, looking at analytics and sort of marketing mm -hmm. analytics. What I find interesting about the, the company, you know, PwC, is that we've got, we're a network of businesses. And it's sort of the ultimate individual sport becoming a partner, right? And so if you look at, you know, the way that the business is structured, you've got lots of independent teams out there working with different customers. And our, and our CMO is actually the lead account representative, our account partner associated with a large firm. And they're looking for data on their particular client. And it also because of regulatory issues, you want to maintain that data per client. Mm -hmm. And what, we're what I find today is that that data is almost like oil stuck in shale. 
right? We've got 20 different systems, everything from Lotus Notes to Excel to uh, SAP, PeopleSoft, you know, and we have to sort of frack that data to get it out, right? And actually expose that, but then actually do the analytics on a particular per client basis. And not only share with on a client basis, but then work with government agencies to share it from, you know, Kentucky to, to Illinois to actually going then to, let's say, London or going to Germany or Japan. And then we have to share that data you know, according to certain regulatory issues. So we're kind of working through, you know, our partnership is now between the CIO organization and actually the, the head account person. This is what, and, and they're looking for those sort of insights on a customer basis. Mm -hmm. I, I would just add that from, from a business intelligence perspective, for the most part, I would say most organizations, this is where we started, we're, we're just looking in the rear view mirror. We get the data, we were looking at it, we were running it through some analytics and basically getting a better understanding of what we already knew. What we, what we found, and I believe most organizations are starting to move towards now, is more of the mashing. So now we're taking our internal data sets, combining it with external data sets, and starting to try to understand what patterns does that form for us. Does it start to help us understand seasonality better, the trends in the automotive market perhaps, so we can get ahead of the curve as opposed to continually looking in the back. That's really the transformation and the piece of adoption that uh, I tried to speak to a little earlier that really starts to set the stage for using BI in an organization. Once we can start to share with the organization how they can see patterns forming and become more predictive on the front side as opposed to just re-reporting what we've already known, the adoption rate goes up tremendously. And uh, that's, that's really uh, the direction that we're, we're, we're moving in. Are you doing unstructured data too, like Twitter and semantic analysis, that sort of thing yet? Like currency no. lexicon? No, basically taking uh, external market data, combining what we know from a POS perspective and trying to do some pattern analysis. Yeah, at Duncan or uh, at, at Models, it, it's uh, retail is detail. And um, uh, it's all about getting that information as soon as you can. At Duncan, uh, we, we got at 5.30 the next day, 7,000 restaurants, and by, by product, by time, uh, we knew everything. And that was key to the marketing because they have a $300 million war chest that they have to go spend on behalf of the franchisees. And if a DMA, designated marketing area, if, if a, a DMA wasn't doing well, they could go ahead that next morning and pump in you know, 10 more 15 second commercials on radio. Um, they could go ahead and, and change the, the whole uh, uh, campaign of what they were doing in, in terms of maybe taking their foot off or, or putting their foot down on the gas in terms of spend. Uh, if a DMA was doing well and another was doing bad, they can shift some dollars also. So we yeah, have marketing, huge. Um, at Models, we, every hour I get an update on the 151, soon to be 158 stores. Uh, every hour we're seeing what's, go what's going on by sports, Sports, sporting goods, license, uh, apparel, and footwear, and to get more predictive, you know, when it's raining outside, I know something's going to go on. So we're going to have to take marketing and again go after and hit, you know, got to go to Mo's, as you hear about it in New York, uh, uh, more more around radio or more, you know, send out a, a, an email blast to our MVP uh, because we it's all about driving uh, traffic and especially in the retail. So yeah, the CMO uh, operations. Uh, now that I got that hat, uh, I, I want to know um, uh, what's going on because uh, it's, it's helped me with scheduling of uh, labor and managing, you know, a, a hundred million dollar uh, labor uh, uh, bill that, you know, uh, P&L that I got to take, take care of. Part time, uh, full time, when do I bring them on because of uh, uh, different spikes in, uh, uh, in sales. So uh, having that data is not just for the CFO anymore because that's like you said, that's looking in the rear view mirror. It's now, how do I get out in front and be more predictive and drive traffic? I, 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 thank you, Dan. I, I think hopefully what we're getting a sense of as a group is that the things that these folks are involved with today you know, transcend the traditional paradigm of, of, of a you know, system CIO, if, if, if you will. 
That said, having all worn a CIO hat at, at one time, uh, and one of the pieces of advice I share quite often with people is that you know it's great to be ambitious, uh, and and many times people ask people, you know, what's the ultimate goal? You know, after I'm the CIO, what what, what do I do? Um, well, I, I think that they're showing that there's this you know new model where you can be a, a CIO and, and and do a lot of different things again to to contribute uh, to your to your organization. That said. Um, having reached a certain stage in your careers, and perhaps you can speak from your personal experience here, what mistakes do you see people making in their journey to becoming CIOs or equivalent types of roles? And are there any mistakes perhaps that you know you made yourself and, and, and learned from? I think, you know, by and large, we live in a, a, a business world uh, that almost nothing is unforgivable as long as you maintain your integrity, I think. Uh, so what, what, what learnings and experiences you know, might you share? Those, those things that, you know, you know, if you do it, learn from it because uh, you, you can still push forward. Yeah, I mean, uh, personal experience, it, it's, you know, deliver. Um, when you're sitting in the boardroom, um, there's nothing worse than talking about that you missed. Um, so cross-functionally again, as we, as we talked about it, getting, getting everybody together to achieve that goal and being able to uh, deliver on, you know, on time, under budget, uh, for whatever you're trying to do in terms of enhancing uh, the business and get a couple of quick wins. Uh, but it's not very pleasant when you're sitting in the boardroom having to explain uh, that you missed and you need, you need more, more millions to, to finish. Um, uh, I think that, uh, that's very sobering. Um, and uh, uh, you do it a couple of times, or hopefully you just do it once and you learn, and uh, then, then you, uh, uh, you, you build up that um, uh, support, and, they, and then they'll give you more to go do, and then you can continue to be successful. So I think delivering on what you say and what, you, and what is asked of you is, is key, whether you are the CIO or if you want to be the CIO. I mean, there's uh, you know, a lot of little projects that are going on that all add up, you, 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 have to, you have to be able to take ownership, responsibility, and deliver. I, I would just add becoming the chief listening officer. I think that's important. <laughs> really listening to what the business is, is saying. Don't walk in with a preconceived notion of what everyone needs. That is, that, I would tell you most definitely, that's a lesson learned. Um, being, being able to think that you're the smartest guy in the room from a technology standpoint, and then realizing that the solution you're really bringing forward is not going to solve the problem that we're trying to solve is uh, extremely uh, a humbling, but also a very gratifying um, lesson once you learn it. So I, I, the question was about what do you see in people rising in, in the organization? I think it's as you move from an IT shop, it's more of a system shop into this new world or the world, world we're now living in where you're responsible for brand. You're responsible for the impression people have of your company. Uh, business leaders are looking to you. They, they have the technology at home that's better at work. Mm. And their expectation is instant on. It always just works. I go to Amazon. They don't ask me to put a pen or take over my laptop. <laughs> Why are you? Right? And so the, the point is you know, helping manage expectations and being able to explain your function in terms of what's the impact to them on their business process and how does it map to their, what they need to do in terms of revenue, margin, or quality. And you know, those sort of conversations you see a completely different response from the business as opposed to talking about why you might move to cloud. Mm -hmm. you know, a conversation around cloud, I see eyes gloss over very quickly in the business side. Same thing for mobile, MDM, all these buzzwords. You start talking about, I'm going to take the time when you open your laptop from eight minutes to three seconds. Holy cow, completely different change. Mm -hmm. But that requires a lot of different, you know, that requires cloud, requires security, everything else. So I find that you know, be, having, having these people as a rising organization be able to explain what they're doing in terms of you know, real, visceral business value mm -hmm. is the number one thing I see that they may lack. Thank you. And I think we've, we've bumped up against the, uh, the end of our, our time slot here. But I just want to thank our panelists for sharing you know, a very rich set of experiences that you know, I, don't, I don't think are, are, are intended to be a, a roadmap for how you have to do it or how anyone has to do it, but simply uh, their own real life experiences that hopefully will be helpful to, to all of us. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Oh, thanks.